Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all very much for coming out on a, on a wet August, mid-August uh, uh, morning. Um, I'm Bill Taylor uh, here at the United States Institute of Peace. Very pleased uh, to welcome back Ambassador Christopher Hill. Um, as everyone in this room knows, uh, just completing a, an eventful tour um, in Baghdad. Um, Ambassador Hill had a long career, um, starting with the Peace Corps, actually, in Cameroon a long time ago. Um, he has been ambassador in many places, including Korea and Macedonia and Kosovo, Poland, uh, uh, and Iraq. Uh, he's been the leader of the Six Party Talks in, uh, in North Korea. He's been Assistant Secretary of State. Um, so this is the end of one chapter, but he now goes on to the next chapter in his career where he will be the dean of the Corbell School of International Studies at Denver University, starting very soon. Um, so we're very pleased uh, to have him here. He takes off very shortly to go back briefly to uh, Little Compton, Rhode Island. <coughs> uh, well, well kept secret um, in, in Rhode Island, the home of the best ice cream parlor in the country, I'm convinced. Gray's ice cream. If you go to Little Compton, you should visit. Uh, also, uh, avid Red Sox fan will be ha watching from a distance uh, uh, from Colorado. So um, we're very pleased to – ah, another Red Sox fan here. Uh, ah, yes. uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Ambassador Hill. Um, I'm hoping he will be able to look forward uh, some lessons learned, but visions of where we're going with uh, this relationship with the United States and Iraq. Um, we will have a good opportunity for questions. There are people in Baghdad um, and people in Beirut who are watching us online. Uh, we may get some questions from them as well. Look forward to questions from this group as well as an overflow um, audience uh, in, a, in a close by room. So please silence your uh, phones and welcome uh, Ambassador Hill. Thank you very much, uh, Bill, and thank you for uh, inviting me to the old uh, USIP building, <laughs> showing its age, I guess. Uh, but uh, I know you're all looking forward to this uh, um, building, which sort of is, what, larger than the Houston Astrodome? <laughs> no, or, no, no, you know, no. One of the eight wonders of the world. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, under budget, though, right? Absolutely. I, I hope. And anyway, anyway. <laughs> So, yeah, so I, I am leaving the State Department not only because our view of the Potomac has been obstructed by the uh, new. <laughs> yeah, I've always liked the views of the USIP. I just didn't know that was literal. But, uh, but uh, let me just say it, it is uh, really a great pleasure to be, to be back here. Um, I have uh, wound up 16 uh, months in, in Iraq, uh, as they say, in um, – in, uh, the World Cup, I, I went into uh, extra time there. I was planning to make it uh, 12 months, but uh, I did try to want to see if I could be helpful on the issue of uh, government formation, which is uh, a bit of a labor of love because uh, it's uh, from day to day. It's a very, very painful process, uh, but uh, it will get done. It will get done. Uh, let me just say that um, uh, for those um, who who have served there. Uh, there is no more sort of searing time in one's life than to uh, work in Baghdad or in one of our many uh, provincial reconstruction teams. We have a very uh, strong team there. Uh, Ambassador Jim Jeffries is, I think, arriving probably as we speak in, in, in Baghdad. I think it's a uh, it's a place where I think the Foreign Service has really uh, has embraced uh, the monumental challenge of this uh, civilian military transition, but also the transition of, uh, of uh, Iraq more broadly and the transition of the U.S. relationship in, in Iraq. And I'm very proud of uh, all the Foreign Service officers who've gone there. As you know, uh, people don't go with their families, uh, so instead of uh, living with one's wife and children, you live with a roommate. You've filled out a form to make sure the roommate doesn't smoke or doesn't party late or you know doesn't wake up too early or wake up too late. Um, it's quite a uh, it's quite an experience, and you also experience the uh, the uh, thrill of getting a so-called duck and cover al uh, alarm that um, certain periods, in fact, we've just come off of several weeks in which we had um, rocket fire just about every day on the, on the green zone. And so you get this duck and cover. 
the new people, you know, leap out of bed and hide under their beds. The old people just sort of keep on going. And then if you're there for just a couple more days, you also start leaping out of your bed and jumping under your bed. So it's uh, it's uh, it's an experience uh, to live there, to be sure. Um, but I really do believe that if you look at sort of where we've been there and where we're going, that uh, it is definitely going in, in the right direction. I arrived there in, in April. I remember arriving at 8.30 at night. I presented my credentials to the uh, foreign minister, my, copies of my credentials to the foreign minister at 9.30. At about 11 o'clock, I presented the actual credentials to the president. At midnight, I sat down to a banquet of uh, Turkish Turkish food, I mean, I'm sorry, Kurdish food, uh, which included a serving of turkey. Uh, and then uh, about 1.30 in the morning, I re returned back to my home. I uh, At 7 o'clock, I think I had Leon Panetta to breakfast. At 8.30, Secretary Clinton arrived. And by the end of the day, about when she left, around 8 o'clock at night, that was on a Saturday night, and I said, well, gosh, I'm glad tomorrow is Sunday. And they said, no, that's the first day of the work week around here. So... <laughs> So it's um, it kind of uh, you get there it kind of grabs you by the throat and doesn't uh, doesn't let you go it's a uh, it's an extremely uh, energetic very busy place where I mean you just kind of throw yourself into things and as I said I'm just very proud of the Americans who've uh, who've come there and, and who continue to go there to to make it all work um, in Iraq it's you know one sort of series of problems after after the next. Uh, I th uh, when I got there, we were dealing with uh, the fact that we had our U.S. troops still in, in numbering at about the 140,000 level, and we were beginning the process of relocating those troops out of the cities, out of the towns, out of the principalities, into the countryside, and sort of turning over responsibilities to the, to the Iraqi army. And I know there was a lot of concern at the time, could the Iraqi army manage this process? And indeed, uh, soon after the completion of this process, there were a number of high-profile bombings. Uh, how high-profile bombing is an awful way to put it, but uh, the point being that they took down the foreign ministry and, and the finance ministry in a single day on, in, in August of 2009. A couple months later, there are additional bombings of, of public buildings, and still a couple months later after that. And yet, I mean, the Iraqi military has kind of stepped up. If you look, if you go back and Google the moments of those uh, bombings, like in, in August and in October, read, um, you know, mainstream media on them to see what mainstream media said, you would, you would see a lot of arguments that somehow Iraq isn't going to survive these bombings, that it's just not going to be there uh, after a while, that these would imperil everything we're doing, et cetera. And yet... Uh, you look at Iraq today, and it is still it is still very much uh, moving forward. So, I think there's a resiliency there's a resiliency in any society that I think is difficult to predict. But I think in Iraq society, there's a particular resiliency that I think people need to need to under, understand is very much there. As um, as I left last week, I checked on the number of uh, U.S. troops because when I arrived, it was over 140,000. And now that I'm leaving, uh, I realized it was uh, it was around 55,000, and on a glide path to to make the 50,000 level by the end of uh, the end of August. The U.S. troops have already turned over, uh, have already really switched their mission to in, uh, to moving from combat operations to um, advise and assist brigades that is assisting the the Iraqi military that's really been the mission for several months it's been it was implemented first in the south it's being implemented in the rest of the country so it's not like anything big is really going to happen on the 31st in fact on the 31st of August you look pretty much like the 30th of August look frankly in most places pretty much like the 31st of July and the 30th of June that is they've already made this uh, made this transition so um, I would say the security situation, which is uh, very difficult and one that uh, is not going to be at a uh, completely satisfactory level for uh, at a completely satisfactory level, will be will continue to improve. The Iraqi forces are capable of handling uh, the security problems. Uh, they will 
have problems. There will be mistakes. We have made mistakes, too, in how we've handled it. They will learn from their mistakes as we learn from our mistakes. And I think you will see a continued improvement in the security situation. I think, similarly, we are in the midst of a very difficult process of government formation. And uh, this is a process that if you have the stomach to follow it every day, uh, you'd better take some Pepto-Bismol uh, because it is not easy. I mean, every day you will see uh, you will see setbacks. You will see sort of clutchless shifts in people's positions where you thought they were in one place on Tuesday and they're quite another place on Thursday. Um, it is frankly, uh, you know, hard to follow, let alone hard to stomach through these uh, through these periods. But I think one has to kind of step back from it now and again and sort of look at the overall situation, where Iraq is and where it's going to go. And I think, once again, you can see that with respect to the, the government formation, as difficult as the process is, as heated as the process is, and I would seriously recommend not trying to follow it just from the press because uh, you will find it even more heated in that uh, through that medium, you will see that at some point, like every country, Iraq will have a government. And uh, so the real question for us is not whether they're going to have a government. They will. The question is, how is the United States going to interact with this country? Can we say that we will have the kind of uh, long-term special relationship that we've been talking about for many years? Um, a couple of months ago, I was privileged to go to the uh, Korean embassy and meet some people who were um, the first uh, educational exchange people, Fulbrighters, what later became known as the Fulbright program, in the 1950s. And to, to talk to some of these Koreans who had come to the States in the 1950s, I asked one of them, I said, what was the biggest um, task for you to come to America in the 1950s? And one of them said to me, it was to convince Americans that Korea is not a war, uh, Korea is a country. And um, about a month ago, I had the occasion to meet with uh, Iraqi Fulbrighters on their way to the uh, to the U.S. and I told them that I think one of your big tasks in the United States will be to convince the Americans that Iraq is not a war. Iraq is a country, albeit a struggling country, albeit with many problems, but nonetheless a country that is really very much in the map of the Middle East, and one that I think will at some point uh, assume its role and responsibility, the commensurate with its size and with its um, very dynamic population. It is, it is today a country of majority rule. That is, the Shia, who are the majority there among the Sunni and the Kurds, have the prime ministership. It is hard to predict who will have the prime ministership in the future, but uh, most, I think, Iraqis expect to see that the prime minister of Iraq the next prime minister will be, in fact, be a Shia. Now, for many Americans, they look at this and they say, well, is, does this mean that somehow sectarianism has prevailed in Iraq and that, uh, that your identity as a Shia is somehow a setback from uh, what the, the sort of civil society that one hopes to create? And I would argue that uh, the civil society in Iraq is growing, uh, the tendency is to more to have more um, secular than sectarian tendencies, but that political identity will be an identity based for the time being based on Sunni, Shia, and, and Kurdish affiliation. Uh, rather than under, rather than complain about this or say that somehow you'd prefer that identity be based on something else. I think it's simply the reality. You know, when people look at the United States and they say blue states and red states and they say, um, you know, regional identities and whatnot, you know, I think you can argue, you can argue uh, that politics is going to be based on some kind of identity. And as long as Shia, Sunni, and Kurds know how to work together and as long as they can, um, uh, you know, reach across this, uh, this identity divide and, and uh, Cooperate that that you know this is not something that we need to fear, and in fact, when you look at the politics in Iraq, you see Shia having differences with other Shia. You certainly have Sunnis having differences with other Sunnis, and of course, anyone who knows the Kurdish uh, 
uh, regional government area, the KRG, also knows that uh, the Kurds have their own have their own issues. So, I think the overall structure of it is uh, is not to be feared by us. I think we can we can work with this overall uh, structure in, in in Iraq, because when that government is finally formed, uh, whether Iraqia. Uh, uh, prevails, whether it's state of law, whether it's some amalgamation of, of other uh, regrouped entities, hard to say at this point. But when it emerges, you will see that the Kurds will have an important role in the Baghdad government. You will see that the Sunnis have an important role. You'll see that the Shia have an important role. Nobody in Iraq, no serious observer of the situation in Iraq, is suggesting that somehow uh, you, you can run Iraq except through the full participation of these, uh, as they call them, three components of the uh, of the Iraq's polity. So I think that will get done. Uh, from the point of view of the United States, is this country going to embrace the democratic principles we need them to embrace? And even though this political process has been very difficult, if you look at what happens in Iraq in terms of the free press, in terms of freedom of speech, there is a lot of this. That is, people have absorbed the concept of, uh, of these uh, individual rights. Uh, are there human rights abuses in Iraq? Of course, like in any country. But the question is not whether there are human rights abuses. The question is, what is the trend line? Are they getting better? Is it getting worse? And I think most observers of the situation would argue that despite the horrific violence, which certainly has unnerved many people, Overall, the trend lines in Iraq's human rights are, are improving. Uh, what is Iraq trying to do with its neighbors? And you, you sort of, is, is Iraq trying to be a stable and a good neighbor in the region? And I think there again, you can look at the situation and, and take some um, sense of optimism from the fact that Iraq has worked very hard to um, tamp down regional problems. There are arguments that Iraq needs to do more. Maybe Iraq does need to do more. But it doesn't mean that Iraq is, is setting itself up in any kind of historical uh, adversarial role with its neighbors. In fact, it's looking for ways that can, it can work better with those neighbors. So I think all of these ingredients would argue for the fact that the United States can have a longer term and a special relationship with this country. It's a relationship that's going to depend on our own people's willingness to see Iraq more than a war, but ra and, and rather as a as a country, it's going to depend on our willingness to um, to work and to stay the course in Iraq. I mean, the uh, obviously we are facing many budgetary issues today. It is not easy at all. But when you look at the overall national security costs of our staying in Iraq, you know, every time a striker brigade leaves Iraq versus every time we stand up another rule of law uh, uh, module or something like that, you can look at the overall um, uh, national security cost to the United States and you can see it falling dramatically. Even though the civilian component is coming up, the military component is going down faster than the military component is coming up. In short, this is not some never-ending uh, uh, never never-ending obligation. Rather, we can see that overall our outlays to this country are, are falling and that we can look forward to the day. It will take a few years to, to be sure, but we can look forward to the day where Iraq will be self-sustaining, will be able to pay its bills, and will really, I think, at, at a time in historical terms, you know, whether it's, uh, whether it's eight years, whether it's ten years, we'll be in a position really to pay all of its bills and be a substantial economic player. When I got there in, the, in September, in um, uh, April, there was a lot of talk about the hydrocarbon law. We made the judgment at the embassy that we, kind of, we, we said to ourselves, what is the purpose of the hydrocarbon law? And the answer is the hydrocarbon law is necessary for foreign investment. Well, I think what we, what we, we determined, and I think the Iraqi government was determining this, is if we want foreign investment, why don't we get foreign investment? And so they went ahead with some oil um, uh, contracts, uh, that is um, uh, production contracts, 
um, with the uh, oil service contracts with the with major oil companies. And by the time this process was done, by November of '09, Iraq has now contracted with 11 major companies, representing all of the major oil uh, oil con- uh, companies in the world. Uh, oil companies from diverse countries, whether China, Russia, and uh, U.S., Britain, France, all of the uh, countries of the uh, U.N. Security Council, but many others as well, and that Iraq, if if all of these contracts is reali- are, are realized by the end of this uh, 10-year period, we can see Iraq will be in a will be producing oil in the neighborhood of what Saudi Arabia produces oil. That is, it's going to be a major a major player in the oil market and a player with its own oil. This was never about the U.S. taking its oil. Indeed, the U.S. share of these contracts is fairly small. We have one, albeit a big one, but. Uh, uh, only two of the 11 major oil companies are actually U.S. So Iraq is going to be a big player. Uh, Iraq, I think, will be economically uh, successful. It is a matter of time. You can see the economy growing uh, growing day by day. You can see the um, nascent development of, of, of Basra going on. If you go up to Erbil, you can see the developments in, in, in Kurdistan. Uh, at one point in Kurdistan and up in Erbil, I went to see a, a shopping mall there, which had a food store on the ground floor. And on the third floor, believe it or not, there was a bowling alley. <laughs> so things are uh, things are happening in Iraq. There are continuing pockets of, uh, of very difficult uh, uh, security uh, issues. Mosul is one. If you talk to the U.S. military in Mosul, they would argue that it was never handled properly from the beginning. There have been difficulties from the beginning there, uh, but that um, the Iraqis know what those issues are. They are managing the security, and I think you'll see you'll see that in these remaining areas where security has been a problem, you'll see it continuing to uh, trend in the right direction. Uh, the U.S. is looking forward to uh, this relationship with Iraq. It will be based on these uh, economic relationship, and it was really quite gratifying to to, in, to be hosting in Iraq some uh, 22 U.S. agriculture firms that were there. Will be, there will be another major trade um, uh, mission this, this fall. These are uh, firms that are in, in a number of in infrastructure and telecommunications, not necessarily in oil, so you will see some diversification in, in Iraq. I think we have uh, stood up uh, the largest uh, uh, academic exchange program in in uh, in the Middle East is in Iraq. The government has been very committed to it, and when you look at the uh, amount of funds that the Iraqi government has has put out for Iraqi students studying abroad, you see it's it's about the highest in the uh, in the region. That is through these uh, through a bilateral program with us. So I think we've um, we've looked to. Uh, develop across a, uh, a range of cultural activities. Uh, uh, we, um, we, we, you know, work with our sporting teams. We, we have uh, really looked to make sure that we have a balanced and full relationship with Iraq. I think the Iraqis want to make sure that we care about Iraq, not just care about it as a, an element of the war against terrorism, but also we care about having the relationship with the country and with its people, and I think we're very much on the way to doing that. So I think we will get a, uh, a government. I'm not going to predict when. Uh, I can predict that it will be difficult and painful, uh, but we will get a government there, and I think the U.S. can look forward to a very uh, important relationship with this country of some 30 million people. Uh, I think it's a, it is a country that will be, uh, because of its uh, mix of uh, Shia, Sunni, and, and Kurds, is quite uh, unique in the in the Middle East, and one which we uh, um, it's in our strategic interest to pay attention to it. If you look at a map, if you look at where it lies, that is next to uh, Iran, Iran on the one side and the Levant on the other side, Turkey on the north and Saudi Arabia on the south, you can see the importance of its strategic location. Therefore, I think the importance for, the, for U.S. policy. So I think we can um, – uh, there will be a lot to do for our, for our diplomats there. And 
I, I want to stress that as the U.S. military draws down, the U.S. interests in Iraq very much remain. We have a great interest in its success. Uh, and thanks to their own efforts in terms of these, these oil contracts, it's not just the U.S. interest. Many other countries have a great interest in, in Iraq's success. And I think one of the first things that will need to be done when there is a new government is to try to go out to the region and make sure that Iraq has that has a uh, as good a relationship with the region as it can. Iraq has o had to overcome terrorism. It's had to overcome uh, dictatorship. It needs more fundamentally to overcome a sense of isolation, a sense of being estranged from its uh, from its neighbors and from the region. So um, I come uh, I return from Iraq with a real sense of optimism about its future. Uh, when you're there, you do get enmeshed in the day-to-day -day, uh, events, but when you step away from it, I think you can see the progress. We are go we've gone from 140,000 down to 50,000 troops just in the 16 months that I was there. We've gone to uh, a situation where they have uh, uh, their, their local governance is, you know, very much engaged in the process of getting uh, investors in. The U.S. has, uh, we have many, we have uh, relationships with many of their universities. Thanks to the security situation, I've been able to travel outside of, uh, uh, outside of Baghdad. I've been to all the provinces of Iraq. I'm sure uh, my successor will be able to do the same. So I think when we look at where this place has been and where it is today, we can, I think, uh, extrapolate that it will have a very good future. So why don't we go to questions? So. Professor Hill, thank you very much for, for, uh, for that overview, uh, both a review of what has happened during your period there and your expectations about, uh, about the future. Um, let me uh, open it to questions. We are very pleased that uh, the Iraqi ambassador to the United States, uh, Ambassador Samadhi, is here with us again. Uh, welcome back, sir. And uh, pride of place, if you would like to uh, uh, make any statement or ask any questions, you have the op first opportunity. But... Uh, I will I will look for your look for your hand, um, and we have the first question is in the back here, sir. Uh, there's a mic coming to you. Yes, good morning, sir. My name is Saeed Erika from Al Quds Daily Newspaper. My question to you, sir, is where does national reconciliation fall on the priorities for Iraq, and what kind of advice did you give your successor on how to forward an agenda of national reconciliation? Because you mentioned hydrocarbon law. Uh, as if it's just a contractual thing, while in fact it really is very deep and very yeah. important for all they, the Iraqis. Yeah. First of all, they need a hydrocarbon law, but uh, I think the the effort at getting this omnibus framework was actually one that was impeding the actual purpose of the framework law. The purpose of the framework law, I mean, you point out it's national reconciliation. That's one purpose. Another purpose was to attract foreign investment and get it moving. And so holding up foreign investment for the sake of this framework law uh, didn't seem like the right approach. So now the foreign investment's there, and I think the, the need for this framework law is, is clear. I mean, they need to do something about the, in, uh, the institutional infrastructure for dealing with oil. Uh, it's also moving on these contracts also had the effect of getting the problems of Erbil and Baghdad, that is, the problems of contracts that Erbil reached separately, those have also moved, and there's been some agreement on those issues as well. So uh, I think the, the result of just getting the process moving has, been to, has, has resulted in some success in terms of, first of all, investment, and secondly, national reconciliation. But I think na national reconciliation needs to be looked at more broadly than just the, the, the uh, hydrocarbons law. I think uh, there are uh, a variety of issues, uh, ter including territorial issues, uh, on, the, um, on the edge of the KRG, the so-called uh, disputed internal boundaries. This is something the UN has been working. It's something that the U.S. military has has tried to facilitate through uh, through uh, confidence building measures, including joint uh, patrolling and joint checkpoints. Uh, the, these have been very good initiatives, but frankly, much more needs to be done. Uh, not only in terms of uh, you know, CBMs, confidence building measures, but also including trying to 
address the governance issues in these um, in these disputed uh, territories. So I think that's something the U.S. can do. In fact, the U.S. can be helpful uh, in doing. I think the U.N. needs to be very much engaged in this, and they are. Uh, I think you'll see the U.S. continuing to engage. We will have a person who is, who is doing the uh, uh, sort of northern um, issues, as they're called, who will be engaged uh, very much. In fact, he's sitting in the room, George Sibley. George, great to see you. But you've got to get to Iraq. What are you doing here at USIP? All right. Okay. Next week. But uh, so I, I think we'll, we'll continue to be engaged on that. Um, but, you know, reconciliation, I mean, um, you know, when you look at some of the problems in Anbar lately, this isn't Sunni Shia issues. These are Sunni Sunni. So if you look at some of the problems that were going on in um, – in uh, Saladin uh, in the spring, again, there are Sunni Sunni. If you look at some of the problems that were going on in uh, uh, down in Karbala uh, in the spring, there were Shia Shia. And so um, I would caution against thinking that national reconciliation is a Shia Sunni issue uh, or, uh, or a uh, Sunni Kurd issue in the case of the uh, disputed internal boundaries. I think overall the best thing that can be done for Iraq is to strengthen its institutions, strengthen its independent judiciary, strengthen the ability of its uh, service-providing uh, institutions. Because at the end of the day, I mean, what Iraq, Iraqis need from their government is not sort of uh, uh, sectarian cheerleading, but what they really need from their government is a provision of more, of more services. And I like to think that some of the um, pressure to get on with government formation is coming from uh, the public that is demanding that they get on with the process with providing more um, more uh, services to to the people. Uh, you know, electricity production is still woefully low. Um, you know, water issue. They're, they're continue to have water issues. Um, so. You know, investments in these areas need to be need to be made. And the trouble with these area these issues is, you invest one year, and you know it's not going to be for a couple of years that you'll see your you know, the return on the investment. So, they've they've got to get moving on these on these issues. Thank you. Um, we have a very wet marine here who uh, <laughs> came through the uh, rain with, as marines do, no umbrella. Uh, they never do this. So I, uh, but there are other people who have, I've got my eye on for uh, for questions. But sir. Thank you, Ambassador Taylor. Uh, sir, it's been a long time since we worked together, sir. Good uh, to see you again. Spent four years all together in Iraq uh, concurrently with you. All right, sir. Um, my question is a little bit complex, and it may touch upon some things that most of the people in the audience don't know about, so forgive me. I'll give just 20 seconds of background, maybe. It strikes me that... The, uh, the problems that we're seeing in the formation of the central government stem from the fact that constitutionally, the constitution of Iraq is designed to serve, to serve a monolithic totalitarian regime where you have ministerial control of budgetary authority right down to the local level from the center through the ministries. The local office for every ministry, provincial level office, that administers that budget right down. There's been some effort to overcome that through regionalization. The Kurdistan regional government gets a slice of the budget. The tension being at the center, as far as I can see, stems from the fact that even though the provinces and a regional government are fairly stable, politically stable, the center is struggling over those ministries. Who's going to control the money, including anything raised through the hydrocarbon sales? So that fundamental tension between political stabilization at the provincial and sub-provincial level and the struggle for power at the center that we see playing out, do you see them overcoming that? Do you see a resolution of that any time in the near future? We saw a breakdown just this week between uh, Ayad Alawi and the other parties walking away from each other. This seems to me to be a big part of the reconciliation that we see apart from the yeah. episodic stuff that yeah. goes on with bombs going on. You know, that can be overcome eventually. But that tension at the center does not look to me like it's going to resolve itself very mm -hmm. easily without a modification of the Constitution. Can you comment yeah. on that? Sir? Well, first of all, I think they can achieve a new government without modifying the Constitution. 
Uh, I think one of the issues that has come up is the question of whether the Constitution, which envisions a kind of council of ministers, whether there has been too much authority that has somehow gravitated to the prime ministership as opposed to his council. Uh, so you have situations where some security structures that should be um, under the uh, Ministry of Interior move to the to the uh, prime minister. Now, if you're uh, Nuri al-Maliki, you will make the point that, look, I don't want to have security structures under me, but uh, we were facing uh, a life and death insurgency. We had to move fast. We had to deal with a tough situation. And so, yes, I brought some of these under me. But I want them back in the, uh, in the ministries where they belong. But what I also want, if you're, if you're Nuri al-Maliki, what I also want is to see that uh, not only is power uh, um, redistributed in that sense, but responsibility redistributed. That is, um, what he doesn't want a situation is you, you create a, um, you know, you, a power-sharing government and then people from another party say, well, that's up to the Shia. They're in charge of this thing. He wants to say, no, if, you are the, if you're from Iraqia and you're going to have Ministry X and uh, if, you know, let's say, state of law is going to have the prime ministership, you need to take ownership. You need to take responsibility and ownership for these issues. So part of it is the responsibility sharing, and I think Maliki has a point on that. Um, I, would dif- I would disagree with your notion of the Constitution being some sort of totalitarian concept. You know, when you look at um, many countries in the world, well, first of all, the, the central issue that every country in the world deals with is the power of the center versus the rights of the regions. I mean, and this is not unique to Iraq. I mean, any country you go to, including our own, has this whole issue of how many powers do you have in the center versus versus in the, prov- in the provinces or, in our case, in the states. Um, the issue is always to find a balance. Certainly, in Iraq's case, there were concerns that there would be – that the drift was going to be toward too many powers – in the uh, in the regions, and somehow this would weaken the center, and create a situation where the cohesiveness of the country might suffer. And so, they try to deal with that in the constitution to make sure there's a strong center. When you look at the kinds of issues that need to be addressed in Iraq, when you look at the investment laws, when you look at the the various um, problems of uh, services and things like that a case can be made for needing a strong center that can do this. But when you look at the issues that uh, uh, you you alluded to, and, and in fact, any time, you know, you visit like a place like Nasiriya or wherever, um, you know, people will say, well, you know, we don't have – our provincial councils are not properly funded. All the money is in, in – uh, Baghdad, and so the only way to deal with that is to go to the ministry, and once you're into the ministry, you're not going to get the services, and therefore this is a problem. So it is a problem, and probably that needs to be corrected, but I would differ. I, I think the provincial powers law can, can ad- address some of these things. I would not suggest it needs to be a new constitution. Um, but So I, I think like any country under a new constitutional order, they have had to strike this balance, and it is not easy to do in any country, and I would argue it's especially difficult to do in Iraq, where there were some centrifugal forces at work that were seeking really to pull the place uh, apart. So um, when we looked at some of the things that need to be done in the context of government formation, we felt that a lot of things that could be done did not involve constitutional changes that is reopening the Constitution. I think there are a lot of things that could be done by statute. And one of the problems with this prolonged period of government formation is we haven't had, you know, essentially, uh, in, technically the Council of Representatives or their parliament is in session, but in fact it's really not in session. I mean, there, no one's proposing new laws, nothing's moving ahead. So uh, that's another reason to get moving on this process. Uh, I'm going to recognize right here, but let me let me just follow up on this issue. The issue of uh, distributing powers within the center. There have been proposals recently about a, a new political committee for national security, yeah. or or maybe it's yeah. called the National Council for Strategic Policy, that would that would establish a fourth center of power. Yeah. You talked about the Sunni Shia Kurds, and they would have each would have 
yeah. one of the president prime minister yeah. uh, speaker and this would be a fourth um, yeah. what's uh, the current thinking on that is okay, that now is that's, our are we yeah. supporting yeah. please that's different that's of course different from the from the issue of, of region versus center but certainly when you look at uh, uh, you have um, these main political groupings you have a concern about how power has evolved under Nuri al-Maliki, a lot of power coming to the prime minister. You're concerned that maybe the prime minister position, whether it was the intention of the Constitution or not, the prime minister position is sort of looming large. And then you look at some of the other elements of the, uh, of the system, uh, including the political committee for national security, where you have the prime minister convening a meeting that would involve the collective presidency, the three-member presidency and the uh, leaders of the blocks, uh, the parliamentary blocks. And then you realize that's been kind of moribund, that hasn't really been called on a regular basis. So then you start looking at the question, well, could that, could that element be uh, strengthened? Uh, could you, and, and strengthen in a way that you preserve the prime minister as commander in chief, but strengthen uh, a, the um, ability of the broader government to be providing policy guidance. And so I think a number of people have looked at this um, with the understanding that you don't want to go into a new constitutional arrangement. And I think the feeling is that you could create a, uh, a sort of souped-up uh, 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 souped political committee for national security without changing the Constitution, but maybe in being souped up you could, uh, you could also uh, put it in statute where the political committee for national security was something that was done basically through a, an agreement uh, through people, but not through a statute. So, you know, if you think, if you look at whether they've got the right national security structures for, for what they're dealing with, you know, I would argue they could make some improvements there. But I would argue that just as the U.S. in 1947 put together the National Security Act without changing one word of the Constitution, <laughs> that you could do something like that like that in Iraq. Um, the problem is there's a mountain of mistrust to deal with, and um, there is a kind of kind of zero sum notion that uh, um, you know that somehow if you do X, you must be uh, weakening Y. I mean, win-win, which I know is such a USIP <laughs> concept. Win-win uh, is considered a you know Burmese dissident in uh, in uh, <laughs> Iraq. They don't quite get the win-win thing. So. <laughs> the uh, Red Sox fan here on yeah. the on the front. Think I make up the six games? Well, Eucala said if they get to the playoffs, he'll be back in. Okay. He may be on crutches. We've been through yeah. this before. Yeah. Barry Schwad, Associated Press. Um, you talked about security problems and all. Is the situation fertile for a coup? Do you have concerns that that might be one way that Iraq, of course, wouldn't be a good way, might turn? Do you have concerns about which way they might turn? No. Is there concern, cause for concern of the danger of a coup in Iraq? Well, I, I don't think the issue of a coup is really... Uh, an issue that comes up or is on the table. I mean, I, I don't think there's any uh, scenario, any realistic scenario at this time that would involve that sort of problem. Uh, the kind, the problem they have is they have these continued terrorist attacks, and uh, I don't believe that uh, uh, you know terrorists are you know exploding car bombs and killing women and children because they're dissatisfied with the course of government formation. Um, I do believe, however, that Iraq, Iraqis have an expectation that they will have a government. Frankly, it's the kind of place where they expect a strongish government. And so I think the longer this goes on, uh, the more people will ask the question whether it's affecting the security situation out on the streets. I must say the, uh, you know, the, the police are you know, working very hard. The Army is working very hard. Our forces are working very hard with those, with, with the Iraqi forces. So I personally cannot point to examples where government formation is impeding the law and order um, effort. But uh, certainly um, one wants to see government formation sooner rather than later, and security is one such reason. 
Pastor Hill, we have a question from uh, an Iraqi woman in Baghdad. Um, who asks on this question of, uh, of government formation, what happens if no government is formed soon? Will the U.S. intervene? Uh, you know, I guess I would have to ask her the question, what does she mean intervene? Uh, the U.S. Embassy, I can tell you, uh, has been working daily on this issue. We are, uh, I mean, there are days when uh, Gary Grappo, the political uh, counselor there, uh, Gary, who, who left uh, just uh, a week ago, I would say Gary had upwards of 10 meetings a day with every single uh, Iraqi uh, political um, party or political coalition. I myself would frequently have um, meetings with all of the leaders uh, on a on you know at times almost a political uh, almost a daily basis. So some people would call that intervention. I would call it trying to be helpful. Uh, I don't think it's in our interest to be pushing ourselves on people who don't want us uh, to be involved. Um, I think we we need to be respectful of their sovereignty. I think when you look at uh, Iran, Iran's um, efforts in Iraq, you see that they have not done very well, and one of the reasons they've not done very well is they haven't observed that first rule, which is to be respectful of the country's sovereignty. So uh, I think we are respectful, and I think as such uh, we are listened to, but I think we need to be very careful here because it's a, um, you know, there are uh, a lot of minefields in that country, uh, literally and figuratively, and I don't think we want to put ourselves in the position where we appear to be uh, somehow taking sides in a way that simply will not be understood by the Iraqi public. So to the questioner, I would tell her there will be a, a, a government. I mean, uh, there will be a government. I mean, I can't think of too many places. I mean, maybe Somalia is an example, but uh, not too many places where there haven't been a government. There will be a government. Uh, the question, and there will be a government that will include Kurds, Sunni, and Shia. The question is, who's going to do what? What about here? My name is Connie Zulama. I'm with the American Kurdish Information Network. Um, I know Bible is not a required book for foreign service exams. Well, and what is not required? Bible. The Bible? Yes. Oh, okay. And sometimes I think it should be, for it has an injunction that U.S. policymakers forget it at their peril. The injunction says clay pots should not be placed next to iron kettles. I know you're not responsible for the fact that the Kurds and the Arabs are neighbors of each other, but as someone who's getting ready to make a transition to academia, what can you tell us about the Kurdish Arab impasse over the issue of Kirkuk? Do you really think the 80% Arab population is going to be respectful of the rights of 20% Kurds? Can a culture of tolerance be imposed on the Arabs and the Kurds without a balance of power? I kind of lost you on the gl clay pot. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, Look, Kurds and Arabs have been neighbors for centuries. I mean, this didn't just start. Uh, I think uh, the Kurds have achieved a, uh, a broad autonomy in, in the Republic of Iraq. And uh, moreover, the Kurds have been part of the solution rather than the problem. I think the, uh, the fact that uh, President Barzani is one of the most uh, respected politicians in Iraq the fact that all of the um, uh, political leaders in Baghdad, whether it's Amar Hakim or Ayat Alawi or Nuri al-Maliki, all of them have, have uh, been up to Rabil to discuss, uh, dis discuss the issues. Uh, I would say uh, the Kurdish, um, the KRG, the Kurdish regional government, plays an important and a positive role. Um, I think they have the the autonomy has enabled them to create a um, a region that I think uh, meets the aspirations of its people for for uh, to achieve their freedoms and to be able to uh, um, you know live their lives free of oppression. When you uh, travel with President Barzani, as I have many times just in the last few weeks, we are going up to Barzan or over to uh, to Dahuk and over to Amedi or or over to Mount Korak and he points out the sites of where the Peshmerga met with the uh, Iraqi army 
over those um, you know, very difficult decades, uh, you can see that the KRG is in a much better place than it's ever been before, a much better place, and it hasn't even moved. So uh, when you look at uh, you know, the investments, uh, uh, you know, I mentioned the mall in uh, Kirkuk. I, I mentioned the mall in uh, Erbil. You should go up to Dahuk and uh, you know, see the university there, as I did, or, or see the investments going on. I mean, I think the KRG is doing pretty well. Um, how do we address Kirkuk, and how do we address the whole issue of the disputed internal boundaries? These are not easy issues, and uh, these are these are overlapping claims. Uh, uh, one side does not necessarily, uh, you know, um, it, it's hard to deal with the other side's claims. And so, uh, I think what we need is a long-term process. I think we need to build trust. I think the uh, People in the KRG need to believe that the rest of Iraq is really, truly embracing democratic uh, uh, principles. Um, and uh, frankly, when you look at the history, we're talking more about hope than history here. So uh, I, I think it's uh, – what I do know is the KRG leadership understands these issues very well, communicates very well with their people, and is a force for progress and uh, – and uh, solutions in Baghdad. So, you know, I think we, we will continue to work with the KRG. We have a uh, – the United States, I think, has a very special relationship with the, with the Kurdish people. We're very proud of that. Uh, but we've made very clear that um, we, we see uh, the KRG as part of Iraq, and we see it uh, – and we want to complete, continue to engage it as part of Iraq and as part of the solution rather than the problem. Uh, Ambassador, we have two quest two related questions, one from Jay in Beirut and uh, Raid Jarrar, um, Iraqi living in D.C., both online. And they, they're on this this issue. Uh, do you think the U.S. should intervene in Iraq domestic politics and support partitioning Iraq into ethno-sectarian regions or keeping Iraq a united country with one central government, which you have addressed? Uh, and, so, and Jay uh, says the same question. Does, does, he, does the ambassador believe the breakup of Iraq into three states, Kurdish, Sunni, Shia, uh, is a viable solution in case of continued sectarian rights uh, and struggles in Iraq. Uh, oh. Is a Lebanese-like solution an option? And that was a question from Beirut? Uh, one, that latter was from Beirut, and the earlier one about uh, uh, intervention was from an Iraqi living in D.C. You know, I love Beirut, I love Lebanon, but, you know, the rest of the world cannot be like Lebanon and Beirut. I mean, it's just, you know, I, I wish the rest of the world had the same food as uh, <laughs> Lebanon, but, I mean, not all of their political solutions can be replicated, uh, starting with Iraq. Um, first of all, uh, I don't – I think the um, – the notion of partition uh, has been raised and resolved. Uh, I don't think anyone, any serious person, can really uh, support that. Uh, it, it would involve you know, horrendous uh, sacrifice. Uh, frankly speaking, um, it would involve horrendous violence. Uh, so I don't think any serious person today is talking about that. Uh, I tried to address earlier the concept of identity politics. People do have an identity as Shia or Sunni, but I think those identities will evolve over time. So I don't think that's immutable. I mean, you may have people who gain a greater sense of identity as a Southerner as opposed to a Shia. I don't know. I, I think that's being developed, but I do believe that uh, the Iraq as a nation, I mean, people as a having a concept of being Iraqi is also very strong. And I think, um, you know, people can have more than one identity. I mean, we do it in the U.S. all the time. You know, you see many, you know, hyphenated Americans. They have one identity on Sunday afternoon, uh, you know, when they go and eat pierogi or whatever. Uh, uh, and then the, the rest of the six and a half days, they're just completely American identity. So uh, I think that kind of thing can be uh, can be managed. So, you know, I, look, this is – this government formation has is, is taken a long time. It hasn't set the record, by the way. I think the Dutch still have the record on that. I think they were up to seven months. And, uh, but, but it's painful, but I don't think people need to start pulling out of the drawer some, you know, really bad ideas yet. Uh, I think uh, you know, I'd keep them squirreled away. Very yeah. good, very good. Uh, yes, sir, here. 
Yes, hi, Ambassador Hill. Uh, my name is Jesse Bernstein. I'm from Human Rights First. Um, and I have two questions. One, I, I was very pleased to hear in your remarks of, um, your comments about Mosul. I think a lot of us were concerned about the forced displacement of Christian minorities in, in Mosul. Yeah. And I wonder if um, you could talk about the protection of religious minorities. I was recently in Jordan and Lebanon, and I met with a number of Iraqi refugees, um, and they all said that they would never, ever want to return. Yeah. Um, most of them were religious minorities. And my second related question um, is about U.S. affiliated Iraqis, people who experience persecution on account of their affiliation with the U.S. And as I'm sure you know, I, I know you know there is a, an in-country refugee program in Iraq, um, but it has a year-long backlog. So I wonder if you could talk about the steps that the U.S. is taking to improve processing for this population. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, on the issue of the Christian minorities, uh, I've had uh, regular meetings with the leaders of these Christian uh, Christian minorities, with the Chaldeans, et cetera. And uh, um, I've also been out to some of these towns in, in Mosul, um, including to see this uh, monastery out of, uh, outside of uh, Mosul. And, you know, these are ancient communities. I mean, this is really going back to the second century A.D. Um, and, uh, you know, the Assyrians, for example, the... Uh, um, I think uh, it has been very difficult for for Christians during this period in, in um, Iraq history. Many of them were accused unjustly of somehow supporting Saddam. There's no evidence to support that contention, yet, yet many of them have been accused of that. And then I, I think um, when you talk to the leaders of these communities, one of the things uh, they are most concerned about is the fact that Western countries, in making room for Iraq refugees, have made room for Iraq Christian um, uh, Christian refugees, meaning that the Christian populations continue to be decimated by people who are trying to help them. So you know, it's 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 not an e it's not an easy issue. I mean, one of these uh, uh, Christian leaders told me you should refuse visas for them, even though these are perfectly legitimate programs or you know done uh, you know whether it's Germany or, or France or, or the U.S. And you know we're not going to refuse visas to people who have an eligibility to um, to go. So. Um, I would just caution that these are these are kind of uh, tough issues to manage. Um, we have worked in the area of Mosul with um, to make sure that you know you get local police who are reflect the uh, um, the uh, local conditions, um, and I think we're doing okay on that. Occasionally, when churches have been attacked and they have been attacked, and not um, in in Mosul and elsewhere, we have worked with the Iraqi government. I'm pleased to say the, the Iraqi government has, has reacted to that, has reacted well in terms of providing um, um, protection. I would say these problems are by no means government-inspired. These problems are not government there. They come from <coughs> other elements of the society. So I, I think it's, it has to do with, uh, you know, we need to stay engaged on these issues. I, I, I have no doubt that Jim Jeffrey will do what the sort of things I was doing, and I know uh, Ryan Crocker did those sorts of things where you meet with the communities, try to determine their needs, see if you can be, be helpful to, uh, to them. With regard to uh, discrimination due to affiliation with Americans, we do, have this, we do have these programs. I know we have these backlogs. I know we're trying to deal with that. Uh, I hadn't heard that it's a year. Um, uh, and I think if you talk to the people in refugee affairs, they would say it's a lot less. But, you know, I, all I can tell you is we're very aware of it. We talk about these issues in, within the embassy. Um, you know, we don't want a situation where, you know, the uh, affiliation with Americans is, some, is uh, you know, we, we want to see examples where people are actually uh, being uh, – being threatened for their affiliation. That is, affiliation with Americans should not just be ipso facto uh, uh, justification for leaving, but we certainly monitor these, these, these questions. And as, you, as your question implies, there are many examples where people have been, uh, have been uh, treated poorly as a result. There's a related question uh, from, <clears throat> from our overflow room, Adam Kugel, also with Human Rights Watch. What steps is the U.S. government taking to ensure the Iraqi police and security forces have been trained? Uh, to respect basic well we have we have uh, quite a tra robust training program going in all the provinces and that's something we've spent a lot of time uh, to make sure that as the military leaves 
that the civilians, particularly through the, uh, through the State Department, continues this training program. And so we have uh, set up all these hubs for uh, training centers. Uh, we're doing, uh, it's not just training police on the beat, but rather, uh, you know, forensics and issues like that. So I would say police training is one of the major elements uh, of the U.S. Uh, uh, of the civ military uh, transition. Very good. Sir. Yes. You do. You do, and it's coming. And, and you'll be next. Warren Strobel with uh, McClatchy Newspapers. Chris, you mentioned several times in your opening remarks the need to remind or convince the American people that uh, Iraq is a country, not a war. I'm curious, how concerned are you that the Congress and the American people might not uh, be willing to provide continued resources for a large-scale civilian presence in, in a war zone? Uh, going forward, particularly uh, keeping in mind that we are where we are now in Iraq, but seven years ago this was a controversial and unpopular war. Yeah. Thanks. I, I think, um, uh, you know, we, we work a lot with congressional staff. We work for with uh, congressional members. Um, you know, I, I think Iraq was a, uh, you know, it's been a difficult seven years, and quite an emotional seven years when you look at the thousands of Americans that have been killed and the uh, the concern that the objectives or that the uh, causes bellus, uh, you know, has uh, in, in many people's minds has changed. You know, that is why we went in there. Uh, so um, so I, I think, first of all, you have to respect the person on the other side of the issue here. You know, you can't just dismiss these concerns about uh, Iraq as coming from people who are uninformed. I mean, it's been a tough issue. I mean, I would argue that we've gotten to the point where um, our programs are slimming down and where our, um, even though there are different committees doing this, that is, defense uh, appropriations is different from state ops, uh, state, uh, state department appropriations, um, and so the State Department, uh, State Ops may think that the numbers are going way up, but if they look at what the overall hit is in terms of national security, the numbers are, are definitely coming down. And I would just argue that, you know, we live in an era now where we're doing these so-called fourth phase, you know, civilian ops, uh, and I think it's time that people kind of took a more holistic view of how to measure our, our engagement. And if you just consider, you know, military operations and civilian operations as apples and oranges, uh, I don't think that's the right way to look at it. I mean, I think um, we are taking over a number of duties that were previously done by the military, and because they are appropriately civilian uh, missions, such as police training. Uh, I think the military has done a fabulous job of police training, but it can't keep doing that. That has to be done by civilians. And so... Um, what I don't want is a kind of situation where because the civilians can't get the money to do that, we have to keep uh, tasks on the military side. Um, I, I think the you – know, these are it's, – it's not easy because, uh, you know, the military, for example, has, uh, you know, a couple of major deployments, Afghanistan and Iraq. State Department needs to be there, needs to be there in a big way. But, you know, we have about 178 other deployments. I mean, we are not uh, – you know, we we don't just all go to Iraq and Afghanistan. We have major relationships. You know, China. Uh, you know, Indonesia. Um, you know, even the much maligned Embassy Paris. That's a major relationship we have there. I mean, uh, you know, France is a very important place for our interests, and not only in France, but our interests in many other parts of the world. We need a first-rate embassy in Paris. So we have to balance all of these things while stepping up and making sure we get done what needs to get done. And so it isn't easy, but, um, you know, we have some extremely talented people working on these issues, working with the Congress. And so uh, in answer to your question, I think we will figure it out because I do think it, it makes sense. Staying on this topic of, uh, of the transition from military to civilian operations, um, we have a question online. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Ambassador Hill's perspective on the use of PRTs as the U.S. drawdown continues. And more broadly, we understand that there had been the plan for five of the embassy yeah. branch offices, uh, and that may be uh, down to four. As you indicate, the resources may not be there. 
um, there, as you've indicated, a lot of talented people thinking about this transition. Um, yeah. If you could say a little more about that. Um, you know, I thought this whole issue of five to four was being handled in very hush-hush meetings, uh -huh. and the, but <laughs> here we are on television discussing it, so why not? Uh, boy. Um, you know, to manage your relationship in Iraq, you can't just do it from one place in Baghdad. You've got to be kind of forward deployed in a number of areas. In an ideal world, you'd like to be forward deployed in Anbar. You'd like to be in Najaf. You'd like to be in Diyala. You'd like to be in Kirkuk, Mosul, Erbil, uh, Basra. Um, when you start costing these things out, they're not cheap. And um, the issue really is when you start looking at uh, so-called life sustainment, uh, if you look at some of the transport issues, uh, um, it's not easy to put people out there. I mean, it's one thing to put people in harm's way. It's another thing to put people in, in a place where, you know, you don't have the means to, de to defend them. And this is all assuming that we – this is a period after the, uh, the military uh, – the um, uh, SOFA agreement expires, and with the expiration of the SOFA agreement, there can't be any U.S. forces unless they're there under a legal agreement. So, the, so when the SOFA agreement expires uh, – you know, you have to assume that there won't be U.S. troops. Um, so, uh, so when you look at some of these things, and some of these, uh, uh, to take a, a provincial reconstruction team and uh, take it out of the sort of military cocoon that it's in and try to have the State Department do some of the sustainment, uh, you start running into a lot of heavy costs. Um, for example, some of our, our, our PRTs, our people are transported courtesy of the military in MRAPs. Now, do you want to um, have, once the military is gone, do you want to say, well, you don't really need MRAPs. You probably do it in a suburban, I guess, or can you? I, I, so if you, you, you've got to make some assumptions about what the security situation is. So before you know it, you start costing in MRAPs. And if you're going to cost in MRAPs, you've got to start costing in what it costs to maintain an MRAP. And before you know it, you're into some big numbers. Uh, so um, I think it's, it's, you know, it's one of these things where, you know, to uh, you know, Warren's previous question, I mean, you've got to kind of work out what is the most crucial. Um, can you handle some issues by, via – you know, sort of a more robust travel plan from the uh, from the embassy. Where do you really need people stationed all week long, or all month long, or all year long? I mean, the, those questions. And so, uh, you know, you come up with like a lot of things in life. I mean, I'll bet the USIP building was twice as large as the one that was uh, <laughs> finally built. So you have to make some some adjustments. Right, and, right. Uh, but what I can tell you is that uh, whatever finally emerges in in our in our sort of footprint uh, in Iraq, uh, and by the way, we've informed the Iraqi government on this. We have permission to move on this because this is not just some unilateral decision on our part. Uh, but I can assure you that we will have a footprint where people, we will have the right people in the right place. They will be protected. We are not going to put people at any undue risk, and that it will be commensurate and uh, consistent with our uh, our country's objectives in that country. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Lee with Voice of America. There are some in Iraq who, when they look at their history of conflict when it comes to political, religious, and cultural, wonder if the current system of government is going to work. And they look at how painful this government building process is now. Um, they fear that when in, there is a government in place that it might be weak and unstable. Are these fears justified in your opinion, and what can be done to ensure that the government is effective? Yeah, it's sort of, I mean, it's kind of a broad question, but uh, Iraqis are very used to strong government, but for obvious reasons they fear strong government as well. So um, you know, the alternative to strong government is weak government, and then they worry about that as well. So uh, it, it's... I'm convinced that, um, you know, to use the old line that democracy is the, you know, the, uh, 
the, the best form of government because it's be, it, it's difficult, but it's better than all the others. Uh, I, I don't see any other model out there for Iraq. Uh, I mean, the notion that, well, this is difficult, let's go back to, you know, mass murder, which is essentially what Saddam Hussein. I mean, the trouble with a little authoritarianism is it's tough to keep at just a little. <laughs> Uh, so um, the notion that you can go to some kind of other model and say, okay, it'll be benign authoritarianism, it's, it's hard to keep it benign. So I, I think they got the right system. And uh, the issue is to try to make it work. Uh, you know, like, you know, whether it's a marriage or anything, you just try to make it work. And so obviously it's going to be, it's going to be difficult. Uh, but, you know, I think, you know, in this government formation, I, I am sure that people will look back at this period and they will, there will be lessons learned from this period. So I don't panic about this at all. Uh, I think what needs to be done is, you know, people need to stay calm, and it's hard to do when it's 125 degrees out. Um, it's tough to do right now in Ramadan where no one's eating until after sundown. Uh, so... You know, I, I think they just got to get through this. And as for what Iraq had in the past, you know, in most countries, most countries in the world, if you look at their past, there's not a lot of inspiration there for good governance. I think you, this is one of these things where you have to look forward. Yeah. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Sidar. I'm Najmi Jibouri the former uh, mayor uh, in Tel Afar in Iraq. Uh -huh. I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, about the democracy in uh, Iraq, many Iraqi insiders uh, believe that uh, whoever becomes the next prime minister in Iraq will ensure that he stay in uh, power for many years, like any leader in the region, uh, and because that uh, Al Maliki captured the chair, and he don't want to leave the uh, chair. Uh, you think the democracy in uh, process in Iraq in the future uh, work? This one, yeah. and how you read both America and uh, Iran? Want Al Maliki stay in the power? Thank you. I'm sorry. How Iran did you say? Uh, how both America and Iran want Al Maliki stay in the power? Well, it's not up to us, and it's not up to Iran. It's going to be up to what the Iraqis decide on how long uh, they want Prime Minister Maliki to stay. I mean, with re the other question you ask is an interesting, very interesting question because it really goes to the question of term limits. <laughs> and you know we've had them. You know we've had this issue come up in the U.S. Uh, about term limits. That is, the longer people stay, the longer they'll stay even further. And uh, and then you find you know you worry about issues like corruption, et cetera, et cetera. So should you have term limits? You know, and uh, a lot of countries have looked at it. Uh, you know, we didn't have term limits for the U.S. president until um, after World War II, uh, when we passed a constitutional amendment and had term limits. So. Um, it would not surprise me if the Iraqi people had a debate about this. And it, w it would not be astonishing to me if there were some effort to have term limits uh, because of the sphere that you mentioned uh, and a fear rooted in, in how governance is often done in the region. That is, once you're in, you stay. And um, yeah, I'm not sure that's necessarily good for any country. What the term limit would be, do you have two terms, three terms, I mean, what, what do you do? I, again, I think people need to look at it, and there are pros and cons of it, you know, too, because running Iraq is, uh, is not for amateurs. I mean, you know, running that country, uh, as, as you know, it's, it's a complicated matter. So you can't just say, okay, you know, you'll have six months and out you go and we'll put someone else. I, I would be careful of that. I think you need some real professionalism in how you run it. But I think the concern that somehow whether it's a Maliki government or some other government, that they stay and stay, I, I think is something the Iraqi people ought to have a discussion about and make a decision on. So it's been done in many other countries. You know, I, I say this to the point where I'm, I'm bored myself, let alone the people I'm talking to, but, you know, Iraq is unique. Its problems are not unique. 
And this notion that somehow Iraq has discovered that there's such a thing as term limits and that no one else has ever contemplated that issue, wrong. I mean, there are a lot of, of problems that are all over the world, and Iraq can learn from how other countries have dealt with them. So now I've bored you with that, too. But I really, I, I know it's blindingly obvious, but uh, it needs to be restated. There are a couple of questions uh, <clears throat> from representatives of embassies here in Washington and from overseas, Ambassador Hill. Embassies uh, overseas? No, no, no. Oh, uh, oh, embassies okay. here in Washington and then a couple of overseas questions as well. Okay. okay. Um, the overseas question relates to the Iran uh, issue. Does the uh, – what is the political role of Iran in the future of stable Iraq? Does their aforementioned lack of respect for Iraqi sovereignty pose a threat to a newly formed government? So that's kind of the, one uh, – Lack of respect uh, – For Iraq's sovereignty. Coming from Iran. Ah. Okay. So does that pose a uh, threat to a newly formed government, which you have said is coming, but it's. Uh, yeah. So that, that's one question. Yeah. Then, then a related one yeah. from the embassies here, uh, one from Embassy Poland, Embassy Israel, um, having to do with kind of coordination among allies. And this one uh, talks about the engagement in the next phase. The U.S. going to work closely with the NATO training mission um, in yeah. Iraq, um, and in particular with the uh, EU LEX mission, just LEX as Justice Secretary Reform is concerned, in order to coordinate the efforts? And um, is the U.S. working with other countries, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, to make sure that interests are the same, that is a stable Iraq, in a regional framework? Okay. So kind of you know, related on, questions. On Iran, I mean, <clears throat> actually there's more talk about this in Washington than there is in Baghdad. I, I you know, Iraqis, I don't care who you are in Iraq, you don't plan to sell your country to Iran. I mean, it's – so I hear a lot of people described as pro-Iranian. You know, when you talk to them, they're not pro-Iranian. I, I, I really think there's a lot of exaggeration in that, um, in the degree to which there are Iraqis who are looking to sell the country's interest to Iran. What is not exaggerated, unfortunately, though, is the degree to which the Iranians have engaged in mischief in Iran – in Iraq. And the fact that um, – these, some of these uh, extremist groups uh, get training, get equipment from Iraq is is from Iran is uh, is a fact. Uh, a um, 107 millimeter rocket that landed in my yard a few months ago, it had Iran markings on it. I mean, they come from Iran, and uh, and you know, if I were the Iranians. And I looked at Iraq, and I thought to myself, you know, whatever we do is not going to be – whatever we, the Iranians, do is not going to really determine that country's fate, fate. That country's fate is going to be determined by its own people as they, you know, get their oil sector going on, et cetera. And if I were Iran, I would be looking to build a good relationship, uh, overcoming one of the most horrific wars in the, uh, in the 20th century, the Iran-Iraq War. And, uh, and if I were Iran, I'd do a much better job of sort of looking at what my long-term interests are in Iraq. And Iran's long-term interests in Iraq uh, are not served by, by uh, allowing Katusha rockets to, be, uh, to come over the border. And they are coming over the border, and they continue to come over the border. So I think the Iranians have, have acted – Recklessly with these sorts of uh, activities, this uh, support for malign uh, – their, their malign influence and support for these uh, radical groups. When I look at their efforts to affect the political situation, uh, they have not been very successful. Uh, Iran made it very clear that uh, they opposed open lists in the uh, – in the uh, elections. This is early on the election law, and the Iranians made very clear uh, they didn't want to see open lists. They wanted closed lists. didn't happen. They're open lists. Then they wanted all Shia together and try to turn this into a Shia versus a Sunni uh, issue. didn't happen. The Shia did not come together. Then the Iranians were clearly the inspiration for some of this politicized debathification. 
By the way, I say politicized because there are statutes for debathification as there are denazification in, in Germany and elsewhere. But um, the, Iran the Iranians clearly engaged in, in trying to aid and abet politicization and sort of wedge creation on these um, on debathification. Didn't work. So they have uh, at times uh, tried to, uh, you know, put their weight behind various candidates. Hasn't worked. Uh, they have uh, invited, uh, at one point they invited all the Shia parties and uh, plus uh, some of the Kurdish parties to, you know, ha have a government made in Tehran. Didn't work. So when you look at how influential they are, I I'd be careful with the notion that they somehow uh, – um, call the tune or call the shots in, in Iraq. I'd be careful the notion that Ir Iraqis, even Iraqis who want to have a good relationship with this um, neighbor that's been their neighbor for centuries, uh, I'd be careful with the notion that those people, even though they want a good relationship with Iran, are somehow doing Iran's work for them. They're not. So I, I think if I were the Iranians, I'd sort of... Uh, um, take a deep breath and look to see what my long-term interests are and behave a little differently. And U.S. coordination with allies both in Europe oh, yeah. and, these uh, are, and in the yeah, region. Yeah, these are really good ideas. And uh, uh, General Barbero has been working this uh, in the, some of these NATO training missions, and uh, we've been very pleased with some of the NATO countries that have been interested in, uh, in working on um, – to help the Iraqi army. We think the more exposure Iraq gets, again, I, I, I want to emphasize terrorism and dictatorship, we know about those. Isolation has been a very serious problem for that country. And to the extent that they can be exposed to NATO training missions, uh, I, I think we think it's all very <coughs> positive. Uh, the Poles have been there as part of it. Uh, uh, we've seen some of the uh, Scandinavian, I mean, the uh, Danes involved, I think. Uh, the uh, French have been very interested in this. I think this is very positive, and I would look to see more of this kind of thing. I, I think what is most gratifying is to, is to see that as the years go by, the months and years go by, Iraq is more and more understood to be the important player that, uh, that it is in the, in the region. It's not just a... Uh, a, a U.S. Uh, a U.S. issue. I mean, when I went to the uh, I went to the uh, opening, the uh, convocation of the um, the uh, Sw new Swedish embassy. Um, uh, it was attended by the Swedish Foreign Minister Carl Bildt. Inevitably, we said it was the house that Carl built, but uh, <laughs> uh, but it was a uh, you know it was really very serious embassy. It was great to see. I mean, the, the Swedes are, you know, talking about doing, you know, other things up in northern Iraq and, you know, very engaged. And I think the more European countries uh, get involved with Iraq, the better. Very good. Very good. Sir? Yeah, you were. Yeah, I, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, right here. And then, then coming back. Yes. Ah. Oh, the Aberdeen. Ambassador Hill, you gave us an optimistic scenario. I always do. <laughs> My question to you, based on your experience in Iraq, do you see on the horizon an Iraqi Lincoln whom all groups can look up to and respect? An Iraqi Lincoln? The car or the president? <laughs> uh, um, you know... I think um, not to um, tamp down that sense of optimism, um, I'd like to see actually more Iraqis engaged in the political process. And uh, frankly speaking, seven years into their democracy, albeit a democracy that is, uh, you know, work in progress, uh, one would have liked to see some new faces <laughs> after seven years. And yet, um, there are not a lot of new faces there. Uh, so, I think it's important for uh, young people in Iraq to understand this is their Iraq, this is their country, and they have a great opportunity to build a very, very new state. And uh, I must say, when I've gone to some of the universities, um, 
I don't hear Iraqi kids talking about Shia and Sunni and, you know, Article 140 or all these issues. I mean, most of them are saying, do you think my engineering degree will be good enough for when the uh, ExxonMobil comes? Do you think they'll accept my engineering degree? Which I think is a great question. I, I didn't know the answer to it, but I – but um, <coughs> I, I hope that, um, you know, democracy will spawn a kind of uh, interest in, uh, in political activity in a, um, in a civil society. Um, it is encouraging that the Iraqi government uh, last year went ahead with an NGO law because, uh, you know, I, I mean, in many of these uh, new democracies, the development of the NGO sector, I mean, NGOs are sort of the uh, protoplasm of uh, democratic structures. I mean, these are activists, people who go out there, care about the community. Um, in the Middle East, sometimes those have been um, not, n not positive structures. I think with this NGO law and with some of the approach of some of these kids, I, I see it as very positive, and, and I hope that that will – you know, that we will see some of these political parties, some of these political coalitions get some new fresh blood in them. And maybe out of this next generation, you will see, uh, you know, some great leaders emerge. Uh, but, I, you know, it's, it's very easy to be critical of the current crop of leaders. I mean, it, you know, you can complain that many of them spent too much time out of the country. Uh, you can complain some of them spent too much time in the country. Uh, you know, it's easy to criticize. But, you know, a lot of these guys risk their lives, you know, uh, doing these things, uh, being involved politically. Um, you know, they, they take a lot of criticism, no matter who does what. You know, the person will be accused of corruption. The person has been accused of being pro-Iranian or, you know, pro-Saudi or something. You know, it's not an easy job. And yet somehow, uh, as my optimistic take on this, uh, I do believe the country is going in the right direction. And it would not just be going in the right direction if we were up to the American embassy or the U.S. military. We were the only players. We need to have the Iraqis you know, blazing the trail and when they're doing it. So it's, it's easy to be critical, uh, and, and, but I, I think we ought to cut them some slack here, at the same time encourage a new generation of, uh, of leaders to emerge. We're going to do – the last question from the audience will be here. Um, uh, and then I've got two online, and that will – if you have time for those, that will sure. – that would be great. So right back here. Good morning, Ambassador. Uh, my name is Armando Rojas, and I'm a grad student at Texas A&M University. Where? Texas A&M. I've heard of it. Okay, <laughs> uh, well, Ryan Crocker is the dean of the uh, school yeah, of government there now. And uh, my question is about uh, going back to the question about NATO members in Iraq. Turkey, it seems like, is pursuing a more assertive foreign policy in its backyard. What sort of effect do you see this having on the development of a new government in Iraq and its stability? Turkey has a great interest in in how Iraq develops. That interest is is expressed in great activism. I mean, they are inviting the leaders to Ankara, to Istanbul. They're very much engaged. Um, I think, from U.S. policy perspective, uh, Turkey is a positive influence in Iraq. Uh, you look at uh, Turkey's uh, economic, um, you know, their investments in Iraq. I think it's all. It's, it's, it's positive, and I think we should encourage that. I, I don't think uh, more of a regional uh, interest on the part of the Turks means necessarily less of a, how to put it, Western aspiration. <laughs> um, you know, we are very much engaged uh, with the Turks on these issues. Our president talks to uh, Prime Minister Erdogan. I, I, uh, I know that Secretary uh, Clinton talks to uh, Dovotolo. I talked to the Turkish ambassador a lot. I used to deal with him on the Balkans some 15 years ago in, in Washington. So I, I think we've got a really good ally in, in Iraq. Um, you know, it's, they have a history there. Uh, I mean, it is, uh, it is amazing when you talk about, you know, the Turks uh, and their, um, you know, why, you know, there are some Iraqis might be critical about what Turkey is, uh, or some Kurds might be critical about what Turkey has done in Nineveh in terms of their uh, uh, engagement with some of the parties there. And then when you start looking into the history of, uh, of Nineveh and the Ottoman Empire, you see the complexity of it. it it's, it's, uh, 
it's always difficult to deal with a compl- with with neighbors where there's a, quite a historical component to it. But I, I think, by and large, we've got a great relationship with Turkey, and we welcome Turkey's interest in Iraq. John in Cairo has the next last question. At the beginning of the occupation, Paul Bremer said that one of his primary focuses, if not the primary focus, was to remake Iran's socialist economy into a model free market economy. Do you think the plan is still being carried through, and what will be its legacy for post-occupation? I, I don't. I wouldn't call Iran, Iraq a. I wouldn't call Iraq a socialist economy today. Um, in some respects, it's a kind of race between the, uh, you know. Uh, dissipation, even collapse of the socialized sector and the rise of the private sector, and I think the private sector is winning there. So I think it's sort of going in the right direction, um, you know, on a path that's very narrow and, you know, you stub your toe a lot on it. I I, I avoid sort of wide sweeps of social uh, socialist versus uh, Capitalist, I'd rather just talk about the direction it's going. I think it's basically going in the right direction, but it, it it's not easy. The last question from uh, Hamouzou in uh, Baghdad is, what is the extent of, of Ambassador Hill's optimism for Iraq after his deployment there? Is he more or less optimistic now than at the start of his deployment? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, at, it's like a lot of countries you're deployed to. Uh, um, first you get there and you say, this isn't so bad. We'll figure this out. And then you get to know more people, and then you kind of start understanding the, the dimensions of the problem, and then you kind of go into a view that nothing's ever going to get better here. And then after a while you kind of figure it out and you kind of um, sort of sort out what the issues really are versus, you know, what issues are going to take more time and you get more realistic about how you view things. And so, um, you know, and then you finally, you know, finally it's time to leave and you uh, kind of look back and you say, well, um, I think they're going to make it. <laughs> and it's usually because um, you can't quite see the alternative to making it not making it. What does that mean? Uh, you know, uh, Iraq is in no danger of being a failed st- state. Or, I mean, this is a, you know, a state that is going to insist on a certain amount of order. Uh, so um, I think they've been through the toughest time. Uh, and so I, I have a sort of optimistic sense that they know what they need to do. And um, I'm not sure us wagging our finger at them every day and telling them what they need to do is necessarily going to get them to do it. Uh, I think they're going to have to, you know, sort these things out on their own. Uh, I think the Iraqi people need to be quite insistent that they that they kind of get some things done. Uh, and I think you're seeing some of that pressure building. Um, but uh, I think uh, it was an interesting piece over the weekend um, in the New York Times, I think, uh, um, Shadid uh, did a thing about American clocks, and uh, I, sometimes I don't understand half the stuff he writes. But uh, <laughs> the uh, um, it was a very interesting piece that it's not going to be done on our time schedule necessarily, and I think that's a very important point to make. So um, uh, it's it's never going to be when you want it, and I think uh, I made the point the other day, you know, if it's instant gratification you're looking for, you better look elsewhere. Thank you very much. Ambassador Casillo, thank you very much.